Welcome to the Orthodontics in Conference podcast, where Farouk brings you the summary of key lectures from orthodontic conferences around the world with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Conference. Today, we're going to be covering Invisalign's Virtual Orthodontics Summit. There were 11 lectures that took place this year in the UK Summit, of which I'll be covering the four key lectures I took the most from in attending. In light of some recent discussions, I wish to remind the listeners that the Orthodontics and Summary podcast is an opinion piece by myself and the Orthodontics and Summary team. Although we try our very best to be as accurate as we can, it may not be 100% each and every time. The podcast is not endorsed by the Institute of Delivery or by the speaker of the lecturer and is the independent work of myself and the Orthodontic and Summary team. Now that the terms and conditions are out of the way, I'm going to be covering two lectures which look at biomechanics, another lecture which looks at using aligners and TADs, specifically in the maxillary tuberosity, and finally concluding with troubleshooting and some tips from Align. And I'll catch up with you guys at the end to give you my thoughts and feelings on the lectures that have been covered. This lecture is entitled Biomechanics with the Invisalign System 2021. This was a lecture delivered by John Morton, who is Invisalign's Director and Research of Technology. And it was very much an introductory lecture as to how Invisalign and aligners work. And he went on to describe the new generation of Invisalign using the G8 features. So John Morton started off by describing how Invisalign aligners work. And he gave two premises that of being a force-driven system or being a displacement-driven system. Now, he described a force-driven system where the desired tooth movements, forces are calculated and then the appliance is formed. And he described this as being different to the other processes used with aligners. This is in contrast to the displacement-driven systems whereby the shape of the aligner is simply the location of the desired tooth movement without bearing in mind the forces generated from the aligner. Now, he went on to describe how the Invisalign system achieves this force-driven process. He described smart force features, which are attachments and power ridges, essentially things which control the position of the crown relative to the roots. And my interpretation of that is that this is the bracket prescription if we compare that to fixed appliances. Also the smart track material, something which then conveys this force to the teeth or arch wires if we compare that to fixed, functional, uh, fixed appliances. And finally, smart staging technology, the, how the progression of tooth movement takes place, how the arches are coordinated. And this for me comes down to the, cord, the treatment planning for the individual cases. Now, he described how the G8, the new feature from Align, changes the contour of the aligner with the tooth surface. So very much homing in on the smart force features. How do we optimize the forces going to the teeth by essentially modifying the prescription of the aligner? Now, he explained this. He started off by describing attachments and the optimized attachments from Align and how the premise of it is to temporarily change the shape of the tooth surface with composite. Now, the aligner makes contact with the tooth surface and produces a force. If the attachment is there, a certain force is created. Now, the the difference between optimized attachments versus conventional attachments is the active surface, with the optimized attachments having a perpendicular flat surface, whereas the conventional attachments having a beveled and gradual surface for the active side. Now, he described how to calculate a force magnitude having a flat surface, i.e. the optimized attachments, allows a precise calculation to take place. He also described the artificial intelligence then works out where to put the attachments to give the direction of the force to achieve the desired position of the tooth. And this leads on to how G8 works. And it's the idea of having a mismatch between the aligner and the tooth allows, therefore, precise force to be created on a certain aspect of the tooth surface. So the idea behind G8 is to harness this mismatch process. And the best example John gave was that of deep bite cases. 
he described how if uh, we used a displacement driven system that each tooth would essentially receive the same level of activation. However, the forces then delivered to these teeth will be different from one tooth to another. He mentioned how to achieve predictable intrusion, 0.2 newtons of force are required to be delivered. So where does G8 come into this? Well, the idea is that there are different levels of activation taking place, utilizing this mismatch of tooth versus uh, aligner, to achieve an equal force on the teeth being intruded so therefore making intrusion more predictable. I always enjoy listening to John Morton's lectures as he approaches aligners from a biomechanical perspective. However, the argument of force-driven versus displacement-driven systems I find doesn't quite correlate with what we see from the key opinion leaders from Align who generally tend to change uh, optimised attachments for conventional attachments. But I look forward to seeing more about G8 and seeing how it's being applied in clinical practice and seeing some evidence to therefore support it. We know deep bite correction is a problem with aligners. We had the study from Albala in the AJODO earlier this year, which showed that only 50% of intrusion actually takes place clinically from our setups. It'll be interesting to see where G8 fits into this going forwards. This lecture is entitled Treating Complex Aligner Biomechanics by Dr. Willie Diane as part of the Invisalign Virtual Orthodontic Summit. In this lecture, he covered three different biomechanical clinical situations, that of the anterior open bite, that of class 2 cases, and also extraction cases. Now, Willie started off with a fantastic introduction to aligners. He described how he's been asked if he does Invisalign. He said the question itself doesn't make sense. It's like asking a sports star if they do Nike. It may well be the best equipment, in his opinion. However, it comes down to the clinician to produce the results. He described how case selection is key to any form of aligner cases. And he mentioned how our fixed appliance cases do not have the same number of wires, so therefore we can't expect our aligner cases to have the same number of aligners. He mentioned that biological limitations are not taken into account in the software planning. This is where as clinicians we need to have our role in planning cases. And he addressed what on the face of it may be a controversial topic of where we should not aim to achieve ideal occlusion. He described in severe class 3 cases where there's bilateral cross bites, we may well think of accepting the discrepancies which are present. He described spacing cases, whereas rather than trying to close all the cases, we may try to keep the teeth relatively where they are and open up space for a prosthetic tooth. He went on to then describe vertical control of anterior open bite cases with biomechanics. He described an advantage of using a staged approach. So to break that down, clinically he will intrude the molars first, keeping the premolars and the anterior teeth as anchorage in this process. Then he will intrude the premolar teeth once the molars have intruded, using the anterior teeth now and the posterior teeth as anchorage. Now in the treatment, this creates a lateral open bite. However, this corrects as the premolars then intrude. When it came to sagittal correction for our increased overjet class 2 cases, he described two methodologies, one of using sequential distalization, essentially utilising all of the anterior teeth to allow individual teeth to therefore be distalized, or to consider using the jump the bite jump approach. Now the idea is here we have to translate what we see on the clean check. The overjet may well be increasing, however we know clinically using class 2 elastics as part of the process we will achieve our class 2 correction. So he mentioned here we need to interpret what we see when it comes to looking at our clean checks. Finally, he went on to describe the bicuspid or premolar extraction cases. And he said we have to have an awareness of what happens naturally with the liners when we have extraction cases. We tend to get anterior torque loss of our anterior teeth. There tends to be occlusal curves which are generated, a curve, reverse curve of speed in the upper arch and a curve of speed in the lower arch as essentially the arch starts to collapse. And the roots tend not to be parallel. And he described then the biomechanical correction of these scenarios. 
So for the anterior teeth, we have to increase or excessively correct our anterior root torque. For our, we should use lingual vertical attachments to achieve parallel roots. There is going to be some dumping in into the extraction sites. So using gable bends will help compensate for this unwanted tipping. And with the occlusal curves which are generated, we can put in a curve of speed into the upper arch and a reverse curve of speed into the lower arch preemptively. I enjoyed Willie's talk. I think he explained very succinctly the idea that each case should be taken on its own premise and we have to evaluate as clinicians what can and cannot be achieved biologically and then apply the biomechanical principles to get us there. This lecture is entitled Overcoming Difficulties in Class 2 Correction with TADS in the Tuberosity and Using Aligners. This was by Susanna Palmer. Now, Susanna started off by describing the three conventional ways temporary anchorage devices are used. Conventionally, they are interradicular in the way we place them, so they go in between the roots. But she mentioned how we have to wait for the first permanent molars to achieve their final position before they're placed, and the TADs can become mobile if the roots come into proximity with the TAD. Next, she mentioned the use of outside of roots positioning or infrazygomatic TADs. The advantage here, we don't have to wait for the sixes to erupt uh, and we can place them five millimeters or so away from the roots of teeth. And the third and the basis of this lecture was placing TADs in the tuberosity. She mentioned the advantages of this process. We can achieve three planes of movement, intrusion, expansion and distalization from a singly placed TAD. She mentioned the eights have to be removed during this process, and that's essentially where the TAD goes, in the position of the third permanent molar. She gave a tip of extracting the eights at least three to six months prior to the placement of the TAD. Now she went on to describe another clinical tip about changing the rate of aligners depending on the tooth movement. So for molar distalization, she'll change the aligners once a week. However, when it comes to end mass, and premolar distalization, she changes the aligners every 10 days. Now, for to achieve intrusion, the, the TAD is placed in the maxillary tuberosity. She uses 12 millimeter TADs and they're positioned in the posterior regions. Susanna gave her clinical protocol for distalization using maxillary tuberosity TADs in class 2 division 2 cases. So she started off with placing the TADs in that maxillary tuberosity area using 12mm TADs as previously mentioned. She will en masse distalize the 4 to, six, four to 7 teeth, so all the premolars and the molar teeth. Clinically, she will apply anterior bite turbos to allow disocclusion to take place from either the upper lateral incisor to lateral incisor or the upper canine teeth. Now, she'll also apply palatal attachments to the upper anterior two to two teeth. This is to keep anterior anchorage during the posterior movements. Reciprocal anterior proclination will take place to create an overjet. Now, the tads themselves are ligated to the dentition using some buttons to the buccal and palatal aspects of the molar teeth and some elastomeric chain to achieve the distalizing vector. Now, after the posterior and premolar teeth have distalized, she'll then retract the anterior teeth. Now, there are some clinical changes that take place. The anterior bite turbos are lost for one. Second, there's palatal root torque at this stage put in for the upper anterior teeth to prevent them retroclining and dumping back. Use of class 2 elastics are essential at this stage for 22 hours per day. I thought it was an interesting lecture, utilising TADs not positioned in the conventional place. Using maxillary tuberosity, TADs clearly has an advantage. However, my concern is clinically how easy is it to place these particular TADs, although I think it could very well biomechanically offer some significant advantages in the process. This lecture is entitled Monitoring and Troubleshooting by Graham Gardner. Graham describes to us changes that virtual monitoring has made to him in his clinical practice. Also how he manages clinical problems with aligners, specifically that usual suspect of that upper lateral incisor not tracking. Now Graham started off by describing the clin check 
being the key component to avoiding future problems in our clinical aligner cases. He mentioned that ClinCheck is a specific bespoke instrument. We need to make sure that we are realistic in our planning and also stage treatment appropriately, i.e. the velocity for adults should be slower and greater for children. He described monitoring intervals. Now, he mentioned how before virtual monitoring came into his clinical practice, he would see patients at stage four and then see them every eight weeks afterwards. Now, with virtual monitoring, he described how now actually we are now able to assess patients more frequently at weekly intervals. If a patient loses tracking through virtual monitoring, they wear the aligner for another half a week and take another set of photos, which are reviewed by him and the team. He mentioned the loss of tracking to the upper lateral incisor and gave five common reasons as to why it takes place. And for me, this was the best bit of the summit. He went through the most common cause, which was wear off the aligner. And he said, clinically, we can assess this by looking at the adjacent teeth. If all teeth have a lack of tracking, then we know it's a wear issue. He mentioned if the central incisor is being intruded, then actually this can express itself by the a loss of tracking of the upper lateral incisor and he gave his top tip to correct this he mentioned the use of using chewies but also slowing down the aligner changes to make things work more predictably third he mentioned the lack of ipr or space being created very typically he described how expansion is not fully achieved from what we've planned in our clin check and he described how in the closed system of aligners if there's not enough space there was a squeeze taking place to all of the teeth and that tends to intrude the smallest tooth, which here is the upper lateral incisor. And he gave his solution to this problem again. And that was to use an IPR strip, a yellow or 0.05 millimeter strip, to check the contact points, even if we haven't requested IPR in those settings. He also mentioned about adding space to a posterior expansion cases to try and make it more predictable to achieve the space we need within the arch. And in his cases, he had 0.2 millimetre of space on three sites posteriorly to account for this. The fourth reason, he mentioned attachments. He said if we're proclining teeth, naturally they tend to intrude. So he mentioned placing an attachment to resist this intrusive effect. He described other solutions using a flipper elastic or bootstrapping by cutting out a button both in the labial and the palatal aspect and extruding the tooth into the aligner. He mentioned we can also think about adding some IPR to allow vertical movement to take place. And the fifth reason is a combination of the above. And this is why I felt things went full circle. Graham had started off by describing clin checks being a customised process for patients, but also problems that they have are going to be, of course, customised to them. And we should have that awareness rather than grouping them into one category, for example, not wearing the liner. We have to have our diagnostic accuracy spot on for noticing why the problem has occurred and therefore have the bespoke solution to that problem as well. I enjoy listening to Graham as I always do. He's a great lecturer when it comes to describing a liners specifically how to resolve things clinically uh, which I've very much benefited from. And that brings us to the end of this Orthodontics in Conference podcast. Hope you guys have enjoyed listening to the Align Orthodontic Virtual Summit. I think it was an interesting one. What I find with Invisalign is that they usually bring forward some new concepts and ideas. And this summit was no different, especially the conversations around biomechanics. It was great to see temporary anchorage devices being included. And for me, that's interpreting that there are limitations with aligners and using auxiliaries will help achieve more predictable outcomes. Finally, I always enjoy listening to Graham Gardner. He's always got some top clinical tips to help achieve greater predictability. I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast. Please do subscribe. There will be individual podcasts of the lectures included with some summary, written summaries in the notes section as well. So please do check that out on the website www.orthodonticsinsummary.com. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode. <laughs>